our next module, Luxor Temple. Now, uh, the Luxor Temple has got a big plaza in front of it, which has uh, really opened out the vista of what you can see. Now, this photo, funny enough, was taken from McDonald's. Um, now, I wouldn't normally recommend McDonald's as a place to eat, but the views are spectacular. Now, what you can see here is the mosque right behind the first pylon. And that is quite important later on, because I want to talk quite a bit about the mosque. Um, you can also see the Ramesside II colonnade that leads from the courtyard into the peristyle hall. So this, if you like, is the Ramesses part of the temple. Now, this is on the other side of the road, and you can see the front half, um, you can see a little bit of the front half, the row of columns there, the Ramesside ones, but do you see either side, we have these very delicate, beautiful columns. Now, Ramses, big, lots of it. Amenhotep the third, we have artistic, stylish. Now, if you had an Amenhotep the third column in your back garden, it'd be quite pretty. But one of those big Ramside ones, it wouldn't uh, work at all. You can see around the area here, there's a lot of unexcavated um, parts of the temple. Um, one day, I guess there will be money to excavate this. The uh, temple itself was surrounded by a big Roman fortress. So there's a lot of Roman remains here as well. Now, this is the Avenue of Sphinxes. Um, we've seen it in the Karnak module. This is where it has led all the way from the Khonsu Temple to the uh, Luxor Temple. And they are currently in the middle of uh, restoring the whole stretch. This is just a little bit of it. Um, and this photo was actually taken a, a fairish time ago before they started uh, doing this work. So a lot of that vista in front of you has now been knocked down. Now, this is the uh, Ramesside Court. Lots and lots of rather large statues of Ramses II, uh, wearing the double crown there and striding purposefully, um, seated, um, gorgeous, gorgeous muscular tone on his uh, abdomen there, a six pack any man would uh, um, enjoy. Now, right in the middle of this courtyard is the mosque. As I said, more later. Now, um, Chicago House have been working in this temple for a number of years. Now, Chicago House are very, very good. They are the uh, Luxor, uh, well, Egypt, part of the University of Chicago. And they have had a dig house here uh, since the 30s. And they have a number of wonderful publications. Now, publications are expensive, but they have put PDFs of their publications up on their website for free. You can download the PDFs, look at line drawings and stuff like that. So it's absolute wonderful resource, their website, so well worth having a look. One of the things they've recently done um, is create a blockyard. You know me and blockyards? Love blockyards. But they've done it really well. Um, it's all signposted and it's lit at night and they've done it grouped and uh, explaining things and um, very, very, very good blockyard. Um, <clears throat> now, the temple itself um, is uh, rather unique in that it has been used for a number of religious purposes. And one of them was the cult of the Roman emperor. And what they did is put frescoes on part of the temple. And it's one of these dichotomies about, you know, what do you restore, like we saw at Karnak, you know, did you restore the Ramses II 
um, or the uh, Amenhotep the first version. Well, here, do you restore the Roman or do you take it off and expose the pharaonic? Um, it, it, it's a dilemma. What they have done is um, restore the Roman and they've cleaned it up and you can see it quite clearly now, um, the beautiful colours, etc. Um, another interesting bit that they've done is um, the colonnade with those big ramside columns had a wall showing the OPEC festival and it's got the bark of almond, the bark of mut and the bark of konsu making their way from Karnak to Luxor Temple. Now, <coughs> what they've done on one piece, is they had quite a lot of bits of the bark of Karnak. So what they've done is they've put them in place on a concrete wall and they have drawn in black the, um, the the bits that join up the dots so you can see quite clearly uh, what, it, uh, what it is that you're looking at. Uh, the, it's, it's sort of like a black felt tip pen drawn on the concrete so it didn't detract from the carvings themselves but it does put them on context. So it's quite good and they've got a, a storyboard just down below explaining what they did. So here it is. So you can see the bits of the real carvings um, fitting into the wall and then the drawings that have been done. They were actually done by Ray Johnson um, who uh, leads Chicago House in uh, Luxor. Now, one of the things that unfortunately happens to the monuments is that people are uh, encouraged, I'm afraid, by bad guides to touch things for good luck or to get them pregnant or give them long life or whatever. And this is the damage that has been done to this particular hieroglyph of the sign of life by people being encouraged to touch it and uh, the acids on their hands, the dirt, the grime, the grease, you can see it all on that hieroglyph. So I, I please, I beg of you if you're coming to visit Luxor that you never touch things. Um, you know, you can do a lot of damage because it does build up over years and <clears throat> Also, you be careful of things like backpacks and handbags and things like that, bashing against things. I, I did see once somebody in a tomb going up with their fingernails and saying, oh, look, it comes off. You know, please don't be irresponsible like this. Look after the monuments. We need to look after the monuments for the future. It would be dreadful if it was this generation that destroyed this wonderful legacy. Sorry, that was a bit of a soapbox moment there, but it is quite important. Now, seeing Luxor Temple during the daytime, it's pretty amazing. But one of the nice things is that you can see it at night. And you get a completely different perspective on it. And because the light is, is pointing up, you can see the carvings a lot more easily. And um, things that, with the full glare of a noonday sun, is just a, a blank expanse of sandy wall, suddenly you can see carvings and you can see what's happening on, on the wall. This is the front of the first pylon, and it's got details from the Battle of Kadesh. And uh, you can see the horse right in the middle of the picture there. So um, very well worth visiting the temple at night um, and at daytime. Well, in fact, the cool thing would be to visit it sort of about half an hour before sunset and see it in daylight, see the sun setting through the columns and then see it at night um, because the sun sets very, very quickly here. So that, that wouldn't make it a long visit. You can see what the Peristyle Hall looks like at night. Magnificent. 
So what happens is you come through that row of very tall pillars into this peristyle courtyard. Um, it's got all these beautiful Eamon Hotep the third columns all the way around it. Um, and it would have been open to, to the sun. So this sort of yellowy light actually sort of fits, you know, the sun and everything like that. Um, so very, very beautiful. Now, um, a tip for those people that um, uh, come here with cameras, don't use your flash. Um, turn your flash off. Uh, if you've got a tripod, brilliant. But actually, I took this photo just resting it on a handy nearby piece of stone so you can get some good photos just by resting your camera on something this one i uh, took inside the temple to the left of the sanctuary there is a birth room um, and it's this <laughs> is actually ancient egyptian sex um, the god Armon is feeding life to the queen and instead of the new baby pharaoh being um, a product of his pharaoh father, he's actually a product of his Armon the god father. And uh, this is a theme that's used when people have some doubts about their legitimacy to the throne. I, I, I'm puzzled why Amon Hotep III felt the need to justify his claim to the throne with this theme. Um, one would like to know what was behind uh, his motivation for needing to put this up. But that aside, um, at night you can see it. During the day, uh, it's really, really hard to look at this wall because it's in shadow inside and it's very hard to see this thing. But here, I even managed to get a halfway decent photo. Um, you know, I mean, it's not brilliant, but it, you, you can see quite clearly it's a god full spirit feeding an onk sign to, to the queen there. So um, you can get some quite... Uh, unique photos at night time in there. This is the block yard. Uh, again, this technique of using, uh, it's not a black felted pen, but it does look like it a bit, doesn't it? Um, on the intervening uh, concrete between the stone. Now, when I say concrete, I don't mean like proper concrete, concrete. Um, Ray Johnson gave a lecture once and he explained that they actually sort of wrap plastic around the blocks and use a, a lime mortar mix so they it could be pulled apart terribly easily um, but it, it sort of joined up here now actually what you've got here is lady eight <laughs> you, you if you look just above her knees you can see her skirt line so these are lady apes worshipping um, which we all thought was terribly cute um, so this blockyard, it's all along, you've got all these different things, they're all well labelled, they're all put together in context. Um, you get to it by exiting just by the sanctuary and uh, go outside the temple, not outside the, the area, but just outside the main uh, part of the temple. And you walk along and it takes you um, back in time. Roman staff, you've got Coptic staff, um, late period, New Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, etc. Uh, they've got a, an animal bit, um, and it's also got a walkway that leads, so you've got an overview of one of the Roman gateways. So, um, well worth uh, having a look at that blockyard at Luxor Temple. Now, we saw at the beginning that there's a, a mosque um, right in the middle of the temple. Um, when they uh, excavated the temple, it was up to a considerable height in debris. And uh, when they excavated it, it sort of left the mosque hanging there in the rafters. Um, there was talk about moving it. 
and people were very, very, very against it um, because he is a very important local saint. And he has a festival which is just before Ramadan, so it does move. Uh, I can't give you a date of it, it it's, it's the month before Ramadan, and Ramadan moves through the year. Um, every year it goes back by about 10 days. Um, but if you get in touch with me, I'll, I'll tell you when, when it is this year. Um, and that mulid is, we think, a sort of descendant of the old OPEC festival because they have boats in procession and it's a very lively, uh, fun festival, very family affair and kids get little funny hats and it's good, really good um, thing to see. Now, the mosque uh, was destroyed by fire in 2007 and uh, Mansour Barak approached the authorities there and said, we will restore your mosque if you agree to have the pharaonic stuff on display. And they agreed. So now we can see all that stuff that was hidden away. This is the mosque right in the middle of the temple. Now you notice there's two towers there. It's not two minarets. One is a beacon, and that beacon uh, was used to signal um, right up the whole of the Nile. These beacons were there, and they would signal things like the beginning of Ramadan or something like that. So that's not two minarets, it's a beacon and a minaret. You can see it's been beautifully restored. Um, this is during the restoration period. So the, the, the fire destroyed the um, uh, sort of wooden bits and then they knocked back all the rendering that was on the walls and fortunately it wasn't cement cement, it was a limey mortar and when they got to the uh, pillars and so forth, they were still there, in really good condition. So this is during the restoration. And this is after. Isn't it lovely? And this is uh, before. Um, you can see the lintel up there. You can see all the engravings. Now this is quite a, a unique view of being able to see the top of the temple. Um, and there again. This is after. So they've left it all showing um, in the middle of the restored mosque. This is the prayer niche that was actually carved into one of the columns. So this is before restoration, this is after. This is another column right in the corner. This is a doorway that looks down onto the temple. So you can see the pillars through the, the door there. You can stand in that doorway and look down on the temple below and all the tourists that don't know about this. This is very unique. It's an elephant. Um, it's actually uh, um, a, the, the hieroglyphs for Elephantine Island. And um, I, I know it looks, it's a bit of a weird elephant, but it is an elephant. That was the depiction of, of an elephant. Um, this is more pre restoration. I, I was lucky enough to be allowed in this by, by the SCA and, and took loads and loads of photos. Um, you can see all the tops of the columns there and the uh, foreman supervising. And this is after restoration and you can look at the back of the first pylon. So now they've uh, opened it up so you can look at the back of the first pylon, which you used, didn't used to be able to see before the fire. Um, here again, we've got more bits of the columns. And this is what it looks like today. So right in the middle of this prayer hall, you have all these <laughs> pharaonic, this is the top of the lintels of the columns, right in the middle of the prayer hall. 
um, and it's been left like that, lit up um, in the prayer hall. So um, we're very, very lucky uh, that that fire happened and the uh, guardians of the mosque agreed to have it restored in this way um, so that we can see, you know, all these things. This is what, this is after restoration here. So that's the end of uh, uh, module two. Uh, and the uh, Luxor Temple, um, not quite as big as Karnak Temple, so you've been spared a lot there. And the next module is Hatshepsut.